Hey, what's up, Grace City? Thanks so much for joining us online today. Uh, we hope that today you are encouraged through the virtual gathering, uh, but beyond that, we wanna connect with you relationally. Uh, we care about you and we hope that you're doing okay. And so you can reach out to us at any time. Um, you can find that information at gracecitysd.com. Uh, you can also, when you feel comfortable, join us in person. Uh, we'd love to have you there. And so when you feel comfortable, go to gracecitysd.com slash RSVP, join us in person. I hope that you're encouraged in the gospel today. Enjoy today's service. Happy Palm Sunday. So glad we're able to be out here in the park, worshiping together, lifting up the name of Jesus together. I want to read before we sing Psalm 118, verses 25 through 29. Here's what God's word says. Save us, O Lord, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he made his light to shine upon us. Bind the feastal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So let's sing today. Let's sing about Jesus. Let's lift up his name today. Let's sing about the gospel. Let's sing about who our God is. The King of all creation set aside his crown. A servant to the Father's love descended from his throne above. Author of salvation, giver of new life, crucified to pay for sin, our righteousness is in the name of
Amen. Let's praise our God today. Come on, let's sing this together. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the glory of God. Come on, let's sing it. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the glory of God. We have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. It's only by His grace we stand Once bound by sin and shame And now slaves to righteousness Our faith perfected by His love We praise the Savior Praise the Savior He has won Our sins defeated through His blood That's true And now exalted Jesus reigns Hail the King, praise His name. While we were weak, while we were weak, He died, making us reconciled to God for all eternal days. And even in our fading flesh, our only hope and rest is found in faith that Jesus saves. Praise the Savior. Has won our sin defeated through his blood. Now exalted, Jesus reigns. Hail the King, praise his name. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory.
from throne on high to lowly birth his glory The spotless lamb has washed away our fatal sin with saving grace. His glory rules. The man of sorrows. The man of sorrows crucified for love he and love he dies his glory reigns Christ the King is Lord crown him seated God, we're thankful for today. We're thankful that we get to lift up the name of Jesus. And Jesus, we recognize that you are high and lifted up. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over everything and all creation. But God, we remember on this Palm Sunday that as you entered Jerusalem, as you knew you were going to die a sacrificial death for your people, God, it was our sins that put you on a cross. And the same people who were saying, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would be crucified at the end of this week. So God, we confess to you our sin. We confess that, God, it was us that put you on that cross. We weren't there in person, God, but it was our sin that put you there. So God, we confess that to you. But God, we also recognize how gracious you've been to us. That the same God who 
we committed those sins against would love us and be merciful to us. So I pray that all of us here today would be amazed by your grace, by your mercy to us, by your kindness to us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. And so now we're brought into your family and we can call you our father and our friend. God, we're thankful for that today. We're thankful that Christ is King and he is Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Good morning, Grace City. Happy Palm Sunday. It's beautiful out today, isn't it? I noticed in previous weeks, y'all try to be in the sun. Today, you're trying to be in the shade. That's San Diego for you, right? <laughs> well, my name is Brooke. I'm on staff here with Grace City, and I'm so excited you're here with us on this Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, and today marks when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey, and people laid down their palm branches, which is a sign of victory and triumph. And we get to know that our Jesus is victorious, and so we're celebrating that today. Um, so... We have a lot going on today and this week, so I want to first just invite up Kathy, start, start making your way up here, Kathy. Kathy is our family ministry director, and she's been doing an awesome job of having our family ministry every other week, and they are doing something exciting for Easter, so she's going to share a little bit about that. If you haven't gotten plugged into the family ministry yet, it's an awesome ministry, and so you can talk to Kathy after service. So Kathy, what do you have there? Can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> All right. So with our family ministry, we wanted to do a community outreach. And here today, you can um, find them at the tents, is an Easter basket. We'll have all the supplies you need. It has candy, eggs, and a little pamphlet. And I'll read it so it will discuss what you're going to do to your neighbors. So it says, you have been egged. There are 12 eggs hidden in your yard. Find them all and enjoy the treats. But don't be surprised when you find an empty egg. It's just a reminder that he is risen, just like he said he would. So we want to go ahead and bless our neighbors. So if you take one or two, and um, the night before Easter, go ahead is with your family, put everything together, go in their yard, hide the eggs, and have some fun, and have them wake up to a great surprise. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Give it up for Kathy and all the family ministry volunteers. I think that's so beautiful. Uh, our vision as a church is to be a church for our city that seeks new life in Jesus. And what a practical way to be for our city, showing the love of Jesus to your neighbors. So I encourage you, pick up a basket or two on your way out today. Um, so another thing that we have going on today is our church picnic here at the park and so we're going to be eating lunch together after service uh, you're going to have some time after service to go grab some food and bring it back to the park and we're just going to be hanging out with our church family thinking on palm sunday thinking on jesus and really just starting that celebration that we're looking forward to for next week with Easter. Um, so in that time also, we encourage you to stop by a local grocery store and grab some items uh, for our donations to the Burmese refugee community. So what that is, is we're partnering with Pastor Silas, who works with the Burmese refugee community in City Heights, and he's going door to door sharing the gospel with 200 families this Easter. And he's asked us if we could help provide a gift for each family. So there's a list of items that we're collecting at gracecitysd.com slash worship. It's really, it's right at the bottom of that page. So go ahead, grab a few items, grab your lunch, and then come back here to the park. And it's such, an, it's such a beautiful way to be for our city as well. Um, and then on this Friday, we have our Good Friday service. And so what that is, is going to be a time of us really reflecting on the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us on Good Friday. And that is going to be a time of worship, prayer, and scripture reading. So that's going to be here at the park at 545 this Friday. We have a Facebook event if you want to share that and invite your friends. Um, and we're just going to be thinking on Jesus this Friday. And then we have Easter next Sunday. It's hard to believe Easter is just a week away from today. But we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus here at the park next Sunday at our regular time. We encourage you also share that Facebook event so people who are connected to you on Facebook can know that they're welcome to come worship with us on Sunday. Um, so we are excited for that and we're preparing our heart for that throughout this whole week. 
And lastly, I just want to say thank you so much for giving. I think especially on Holy Week, we think on how God literally gave his all for us. And so it's a way that we get to become more like Jesus when we give. So we encourage you to do that at gracecitysd.com slash give. All right, now I'm going to invite up my amazing husband, Ethan, to read scripture for us. Give it up for Ethan, everybody. All right, thanks, Brooke. We will be in Luke 19 today, Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as, as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, just for Palm Sunday. Thank you for uh, Jesus. Thank you for our Savior, uh, for our sins. Uh, God, we celebrate that. And I just worship you together today. I pray that you will open our hearts to whatever you have for us and uh, just empower Randall as he speaks. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Randall, and I'm the lead pastor of Grace City. Um, Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, Palm Sunday is the uh, beginning of what's called Holy Week. And so this is an opportunity for us to remember uh, the last week of Jesus's life. Uh, Before we do that, I I wanna say thank you again to Kathy and the family ministry. Um, One of the things that's exciting that we we wanna be reminded of is that um, for us, we, we, we wanna be a church for our city, for our community. And so I think it's a really cool um, gesture to, 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 to offer some of these um, secret uh, for your neighbors Easter egg hunts. You know, one of the things we were, we were thinking of like is, is we were like, should we do a, some kind of like drive through or something like that? But we were like, man, we want to put into your hands an opportunity just to love your neighbors. So it doesn't say anything on the, the sheet, like come to Grace City Church or anything, but we want this to, to possibly be a conversation starter for you and your neighbors. And uh, me and my family got to do that last year. Uh, we just kind of, my, my wife felt led. She's like, let's just do this thing. And so you look it up online, you could find um, different ways to love your neighbors. And so that was one of them was just like this, this Easter egg hunt. And so we did it some of our neighbors and they woke up the next morning. They were just like, wow, that was really cool. And we had some great conversations with them. And so my hope is that you're able to have some of those types of conversations with, with your neighbors. Um, and so today, as we think about uh, what, it, what, it, what, what Jesus has done for us, as we look at Palm Sunday, If you're new to church, uh, Palm Sunday is this day in the church calendar when traditionally we remember that the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. So as we know, like Jesus, Jesus died in Jerusalem, but but this is the the reminder of the, the, the entry in in that last week of his life. And so our text today is from Luke 19, 28 through 40. And over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, this story from, from Jesus' life and the historical account of like when he enters into Jerusalem, but also when he uh, dies and resurrects next week on Easter Sunday. And again, it's just a reminder that we're going to have Good Friday here, 545 right here at the park. We'd love for you to join us. 
But as we look at Jesus' life and we look at Luke, uh, we remember that Luke is the one who wrote Acts. And so if you're, you've been with us for a while, um, Luke is uh, the, the writer of Acts. And so that's like part two. Luke, this book, the gospel here of Luke is part one. And so we're jumping into here, same author of, of, of Acts, and we're looking at uh, what Luke says here about the life of Jesus. But there's something specific that Luke is telling us is, as we look at Jesus, what is, what is the picture that he wants us to walk away with? It's this. And you remember, Luke is a doctor. He was technical. As he wrote down history, he was very technical. And so what does he want us to walk away with? Well, it's this, that Jesus was a humble king. He's the humble king. And when I say that, it's, it's the, the thing deep down in your heart that, that you long for, and you might not even know it. See, because all of us, whether we, we know it or not, we're looking for a king. We're looking for a, a, a rule. Like, it, it's, it's written into the fabric of our world. And what we need more than anything is a humble king. And that king is God. See, Psalm 25, 9 says this, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. How do you know, how do you start to see the humble king? He says you have to start with humility. You have to start with humility. You ask, well, what is humility? Well, in his book, Humilitas, ancient historian John Dixon says this. He says, in ancient Rome, humility was a negative word associated with defeat. Humility before the gods and emperors was advised, but humility towards an equal was regarded as ill-informed. One of the prized virtues was love of honor. Academic research found that a humility revolution took place in the middle of the first century, not only because of Jesus' teaching. Jesus' crucifixion changed the way people understood greatness and humility. The cross of Christ was contrary to the understanding of greatness in the ancient world. When did humility become an attribute that we looked upon and said, that is what we need? When we saw Jesus. But that wasn't new in the Bible. It's always been that way. Humility was always a prized trait. And it's what we see in God as we look at Jesus. And so what is biblical humility? Well, again, John Dixon says, humility is the noble choice to forgo your status Deploy your resources or use of your influence for the good of others before yourself. C.S. Lewis once said, Christian humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. And we see as we look at Jesus today, but all throughout his life, is that this is what he lived out. He lived out of a deep humility. Humility. And yet, he's the king. He's a king who lives humbly. See, all the attributes of humility are embodied in King Jesus. And in our text today is from Luke 19, 20 through 40. Just to give some background here, Jesus has been healing and doing ministry. And now this is coming towards the end of his life. And he's been pleading with Israel to, to come to him, to, to see him as he truly is. He's been pleading with him. And so there's this parable that Jesus gives right before we see the triumphal entry. It's called the parable of the ten uh, minus. And, and, and here's the thing. It was, it was talking about wasting your opportunities. Wasting your opportunities. And so what are the opportunities? Well, Jesus has come back again and again and again and again and said, look at me, look at me, look at me. And the people just want to continue to reject him. And we're going to see the culmination of all of this as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. 
because it's a clear dividing line between who will believe and who are those who will reject. See, and all the Gospels give us this full picture of what the triumphal entry is. And what we find is that Jesus is very deliberate here about every detail as he enters the city. And we see him making this bold statement about who he is. Remember, here's, here's what one commentator, D.A. Carson, says. He says, this is a deliberate act of symbolic self-disclosure for those with eyes to see. Secrecy is being lifted. If anybody had a question about who Jesus was before this, he's fully coming out and saying, this is who I am. It's time. And throughout this text, we see that God lifts the veil of secrecy and and really humbly shows us who he truly is, the humble king. So let's break down Jesus' humility in three ways. If you're taking notes today, here's what they are. It's clear, it's counterintuitive, it's courageous. It's clear, it's counterintuitive, it's courageous. And the first one is, it's clear. Look at verses 30 through 31. He says this, he says, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. And so first, what we see here is that Jesus is laying out a clear plan. This is a clear plan. Earlier, Jesus uh, tells those who, who he heals not to tell anyone who he is. Remember that? He would, he would heal someone, and he says, don't tell anyone who I am. Why? Because there was a clear plan from the beginning. The God the Father has a perfect time and a perfect will, and Jesus had surrendered to it his whole life. John 6, 8, uh, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, completely united in every way. And Jesus is, is living this out, living this, this life out, and living a clear plan. And now we see the picture of Jesus coming into focus. Here's the thing we see. That Jesus went through every temptation that you and I would go through. He didn't like skip over and do like this superhero thing and say, well, I'm just going to power up. No, Jesus truly lived with temptation. Yet in every way, he did not sin. And Jesus lived that way and following God's timing and God's ways. And it was great restraint and humility that we see him living that with. See, Isaiah 62, 11, 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, predicted that this scene that we're looking at today would happen. Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9 tells us 500 years before Jesus walked the earth that this was going to happen. What I'm telling you today is this, that this book right here is not just a bunch of ideas, good ideas that are put together that just kind of, you know, play out in some way or another or just, no, th- this all comes together and is cohesive. And this was predicted that this would happen, this, this very act of Jesus going into Jerusalem like this. See, Zechariah 9.9 9 tells us that it would be on a donkey and a colt. And you wonder, okay, well, did Jesus go in on a donkey or a colt? Because I see right here, verse 30, it says, you find a colt tied. But we see in Matthew 21 that it was both. That it was both. Just like Zechariah 9, 9 tells us. But again, I told you that Luke is very technical in the way that he does things. And so he's trying to get a point across here about the kingly Jesus going in on the cult. And so that's what we see here is, is what he's focusing on is that. 
And in God's perfect timing, Jesus is now pushing the envelope to say this. I didn't come to be popular. I've come to be king. I didn't come to be popular. I've come to be king. But not in the way that you thought. It's different than the way you thought. See, Jesus is boldly forcing the issue, you can crown me or kill me. We saw many times before where the religious leaders and those around, they were ready to kill Jesus. But Jesus is saying now, you can crown me or kill me. And as we look at Jesus, he's saying, receive me for who I am, or you can't receive me at all. The question is, will you receive him as Lord? See, one of the things we, we, we think all the time is, well, Jesus is my Savior. I love that part of it. But what about being our Lord, our ruler, our king? See, when we think of that, we think of the restraints that that puts on me. I don't like that idea. I don't like to have like, somebody ruling over me necessarily. But we have to look at the character and the nature of who he is. See, it's, it's not that his rule would destroy us. It, it actually heals us brings healing into our life as we come under his lordship. C.S. Lewis, again, once said this, he says, I'm, not, I'm trying to, here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the only thing we must not say. A, a man who has merely who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil or the, the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. See, as we're thinking about this today, as we're thinking about what Jesus is doing here, and as we read this story for the way that it really is, that's what he's telling us today. Will you accept me in this way? I'm going to make this clear. But second, it's counterintuitive. Look at verses 35 through 36. And they brought it to Jesus. So the colt, what we know is the donkey. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Now, we saw back in verse 30 that Jesus chose an unbroken colt and donkey to come in on. Check. All right. And why that's important is it's not a war horse. See, what they would have expected if Jesus was coming in to now take over rule and reign as king to really save the Jewish people from the rule of, of Rome— what they would have expected is that he would have come in on a war horse. And instead, <laughs> Jesus comes in differently. You know, for me, I, I've been thinking all week about how I can illustrate this to, to help us understand about what it looks like for Jesus to come in in this way and, and how our expectations really, really don't match up. And here's what I thought about. I thought about this. I thought about a dad rolling up in a minivan. Here's what happens when a dad rolls up in a minivan. Intimidation factor goes down. Cool factor goes way down. It's just like down here, right? I remember driving up to this coffee place one time. She's like, what is this? Like the party wagon? I said, no, this is a dad with three kids. Right, wagon. You know, like that, that's what this is. There is no intimidation factor. There's no cool factor. And as Jesus is coming into the city, he's saying, this is how I'm coming in. With a donkey and a colt. Not some big 
war horse. But we also see that they took their cloaks and, 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 and put them on the ground as Jesus is entering the city. It's not like you would expect royalty to be coming into a city. It's not like you would think for a, a reigning, ruling king to come in. It's not the red carpet. See, we get this picture in our minds that this is a big crowd in the streets. It's just excited about Jesus coming in. No, it's, it's actually a smaller group of disciples. In many ways, it's a laughing stock to the city. It's a mockery to many. See, this is counterintuitive to what we would expect from a king, but it was purposeful. I mean, think about a donkey. The donkey carries the weight, doesn't it? Many donkeys do the heavy lifting. And essentially, donkeys do the dirty work. Spiritually, Jesus is about to humbly do the heavy lifting of what you and I needed more than anything. He's about to do the dirty work. He's about to face our sin. He's about to die on a cross that we deserved. See, what does this reveal to us? That Jesus' strength was through weakness. You know, we don't want to be seen as weak. We, we don't want to be seen as lowly. In our pride, we want to be seen as higher in people's eyes. But Jesus took this on himself. See, this is a, this is a helpful insight from Don Carson. In the, in the midst of the excited crowd, an unbroken animal remains calm under the hands of the Messiah who controls nature. Think about that for a minute. We have to lean in. Why is that detail in there that it was an unbroken animal? Here's why. You can't control an unbroken animal, but Jesus can. You can't control something that looks weak in the world's eyes, but, but Jesus can. It's in humility and grace that Jesus comes into the city, not pointing and saying, look at how strong I am, but being willing to say, I will become weak. Why? For you and me. I'll show you what humility truly is. I'll show you what brokenness truly is. This may be an unbroken animal, but I will come in broken before you as you take my life. See, the amazing thing about Jesus' humility and the, the counterintuitiveness is this, that there is a, a, a God who becomes vulnerable. He's vulnerable. Why? He chose to be vulnerable. He chose to be vulnerable. But in many ways, that's not natural to us. See, his power is being displayed through an unbroken donkey and an unbroken colt. And this is the foundation of the gospel. Here's, here's what it is. You're not saved. I'm not saved by being strong. Salvation that Jesus offers is through weakness. And what does that make him? It makes him an approachable savior. It makes him somebody who, who you can come to and say, you, you know, look at all the brokenness in my life. Everybody else may run, but you don't. He's not a savior on a high horse. He's a savior for the broken and spiritually lost. And what that means is that anyone can come to Jesus and receive salvation. But the way we must come is broken and in humility. Timothy Keller said, humility is, a cru is crucial for Christians. We, we can only receive Christ through meekness and humility. Jesus humbled himself and was exalted by God. Therefore, joy and power through humility is the very dynamic, the very dynamic of the Christian life. This is opposite to how we think. You see, what were the expectations of the crowd where the people wanted Jesus to, to make things right in Jerusalem? 
We want things right, right now. That's why we would make you king, Jesus. We want you to make things right, right now. But what they didn't realize was that Jesus came to make people right with God forever. That's why he came. He came to make us right with God forever. And Jesus is saying, you want to you know me? It starts by being weak. Lastly, he's courageous. Look at verses 39 through 40. And some of the, the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus here courageously confronts the religious leaders of the day. And we see this time and time again as Jesus' life is heading towards an end. And he's telling them, you're missing the point. You don't get it. Here's what he's saying. He's saying stones are smarter than you are. Stones. Like, like, like a stone on the ground is smarter than you are. Like they get the point more than you do. Stones even know who I am and you don't. See, if only they could see. But they couldn't see through their pride. That's why Jesus taught us that we must become like little children. One of my favorite movies, children's movies, is the movie Hook. And in this movie, it's Peter Pan, and he becomes an adult. And so now... He forgets about everything that happened in Neverland. He forgot it all, but through circumstances, Hook, who's the enemy, pulls his kids with him into Neverland. And now Peter, as an adult, has to go back and save his kids. And there's this scene in the movie where... The kids, that, the, 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 the ones that, that loved him, right? They looked at him as an adult and they're like, who is this guy? And they made fun of him. They put him through all these different tests and all that stuff and he just wasn't getting it. And, and, then, and then there's this scene where, where, where Peter starts to remember what it was like to be a kid. He started to remember what it was like before... He thought he knew everything. And it was like in that moment, he becomes a child again. And then he, he starts to just do all of these cool things and all of the kids that were around him, they're like, whoa, it, it really is him. But just to make sure there's this little boy who grabs him by the face and looks at him and starts to like do this number all over his face. He looks him in the eye and he says, Peter, it really is you. Do you see that? What, that's what Jesus is calling us to do as he's riding into the city. He say, would you become a child for a moment? I know you got, you're on your high horse. I know you got all your adult things going on. I know you have all these solutions and these plans for your life. But would you just for a minute become like I told you to, like a child? Look me in the eye and see. Or are you going to stand off like the Pharisees and critique and, and demand that God do what you want him to do? You see who they're, who they're, te who they're demanding to, to rebuke his disciples? They're, they're demanding the God of the universe. Say, hey, you need to tell them to be quiet. No, even the stones would cry out. J.C. Ryle said, Jesus came to Jerusalem to die and desired that all Jerusalem should know it. When the time came that he should die, he made a public entry in Jerusalem. He drew the attention of rulers and priests and elders and scribes and Greeks and, and Romans to himself. He knew what the most wonderful event 
He knew that the most wonderful event that had ever happened in this world was about to take place. The eternal Son of God was about to suffer in the stead of sinful men. The great sacrifice for sin about to be offered up. He therefore offered it so that his death was imminently a public death. A public death. Do you see him humbly embracing the Father's will and courageously going into the city for you? So quickly, some takeaways. How do we grow in humility? Number one, I encourage you, embrace the humble king. Embrace the humble king. Many times our heart, we want to have an answer. We want to have a solution. We think that there's other places that we can say, that's, that's where my king is. That's where my ruler is. That's, that's where my authority is. And we might not think about it that way. But how many times do we put other types of heroes before the humble king? See, sadly, we're drawn to the strong, arrogant type. Here we see Jesus humble in the eyes of the world, weak. And what this should do is this should help us to reevaluate what we value the most. Reevaluate what we value the most. And so would we embrace a humble king that came for us? Number two, rethink the narrative. Here's the thing. This is, this is a reality for many of us that we struggle with. There's a, there is a, a lifelong mismatch between what we think we need and what God gives us. Isn't there? There's things and thoughts that we think, this is what I really need. And we don't get it. And we get really upset. As Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, there's this expectation that this is what we need. We need a, a ruler on a high horse who comes in and defeats Rome. What Jesus gives them is a humble king who rides into Jerusalem and is about to die a gruesome death. And what this should teach us is this, that, that what we think we need many times is not what we really need. And so the life of the Christian is humbly persevering through the mismatch. The mismatch, right? The mismatch of what I thought I needed and what God provides for me. And what happens in the midst of that is you ask the Lord, Lord, not my will be done, but your will. Your will be done. That's where we find in the mismatch it's not about my story, but it's about God's story. And could it be that God is trying to tell us a better story than the one we're trying to create on our own? Could it be that God's trying to tell us a better story? We have to humbly ask God to help us see. And lastly, it's this. Remember that human celebrity is fleeting. See, the people who are shouting, blessed is the king. They were, they, they, were, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which was a cry for save us. But over time, it became a cry for the anticipation if he's going to save us. God's going to save us. But the same ones who were crying it out five days later, standing in a crowd of people shouting, crucify him. Crucify him. And they didn't realize it. It was those two words that were going to be the very words that would end up saving their lives. But for many of us, we need to understand that human celebrity and all of that stuff, it's fleeting. See, the Bible warns us against man's praise versus God's praise. John 12, 43 says this, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. That's what they loved. That's what the Pharisees loved. The ones that were shouting and yelling at Jesus, that's what they loved more than God. And it's a, it's a trap for us. It is a trap. There's a Heath Ledger documentary. Heath Ledger played the Joker in The Dark Knight. And there was somebody giving a commentary on Heath Ledger's life. And we know that Heath Ledger passed away at a very young age. A man named Matt Amato, who knew, knew him well, said he wanted fame. Then when he got it, 
He didn't want it. He didn't want it. See, human celebrity isn't what we build it up to be. And Jesus leads us to pour our hope and love into what the glory of God is more than the glory that we could get from people. And what that does is when we understand that, when that like clicks in our hearts and our minds, we can start to live courageously. And I'll tell you, there's many times in my life where I've lived in the fear of man. I've lived in it. More and more, what it looks like to have true courage, it starts with saying, God, it's only your eyes. I want to live for you. I want your will to be done. And I want to hear that, those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Do you have that? in your life? Is that what guides you? See, what do you see when Jesus enters the city? Let me ask this. Do you see the humility of God? Philippians 2.8 says this as we wrap up. In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Friends, you know that that's the gospel today? is that when you lock eyes with Jesus, you see that he came and he made himself vulnerable and died. Why did he do it? Out of love for you and me. The God of the universe laid his life down so that he could raise our lives up. Do you believe that today? Let's pray. Jesus, we pray that you'll help us to see the humble king, who you truly are, that you deserve so much more, but yet we put a crown of thorns on you. And as we think about Holy Week this week, may we be reminded of the great gift it is to know you and to be known by you. May we be be like children so that we can truly see you and enter into the kingdom of heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage this week. You know, I, I, I try to do this every year is watch the passion of the Christ. You know, we're going we're gonna to do Good Friday this week, but I just, I just have to be reminded, right, like of everything that Jesus has done and it's just one of those seasons in the year where we can come to him and remember because Jesus commanded us and told us to remember him by his death and his sacrifice and what he's done for us. So today as a church family, we're going to take communion together. And I invite you, if you're a believer today, to, to do, if you need a communion, we have Eric over here is going to pass some out. You can just raise your hand. We'd love for you to join us here. Um, this is a reminder of the last week of Jesus and, and when he took the bread with his disciples, prepared this last supper. We remember this. He took the bread and what did he say? He says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so church family, we take our bread right now. We take this together, remembering the broken body of Jesus and what he's done for us. Also, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and said to his disciples, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So remember, we are saved by the blood of Jesus and what he's done. So let's take this together now. All right. Father, we thank you for your plan and your will. And thank you, Jesus, that you came and you sacrificially died for us. You lived the perfect life and you died in our place. And so we remember that today. We remember the good news of the gospel, that we are not saved by our good works, 
but we are saved by a good God who came and gave himself. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we wrap up today, our benediction, it's our prayer as a church. It's from Philippians 2. It's called the kenosis passage. That's what scholars call it because it's the, the, the reminder that Jesus emptied himself, was humble. And here's what it says. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours. It's yours in Christ Jesus. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptying himself by taking the form of a servant being born in in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So church family, let's be reminded this week the humility of Christ and what he's done, and that he's with us. Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the strength that you give us. Teach us true humility, Lord, as your people. What we need more than everything, anything is just to really learn what this, this means, to come like a child to you, and to learn your ways. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Church family, happy Palm Sunday. Have a great week. You're sent. Remember, families, go ahead. Or if you, even if you, if you have neighbors that have families around you, you want to do this, go for it. Take, take some of these baskets so we can love our community. You're sent. Have a great week. Hey, thanks so much for joining us online today. We hope that you were encouraged in the gospel. And if you're thinking about next steps, maybe you want to follow Jesus or you want to get baptized or you want to jump into a city group, you can go to the link below, fill out the connection card, and we'll follow up with you this next week. We hope that, again, you were encouraged today. Have a great week.